Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Chris Hadfield. Chris is one of the most seasoned and accomplished astronauts in the world, and the first Canadian to walk in space. His Instagram account says he is a spaceship commander, TV host, public speaker, mustache aficionado, musician, professor, proud father, and loving husband. He is also a New York Times best-selling author. His latest book, The Apollo Murders, is a national and Amazon bestseller and listed as one of the best books of 2021. Chris, it is an honor to have you on the future space. Thanks, Daniel. It's a real pleasure to be joining you, and thanks for all those accolades. <laughs> well, I didn't write them all. Your uh, your profile account says all of it, so I'll give credit to you. Yeah. All right. Now, Chris, before we uh, we move on about your book and some of the work that you're doing recently, um, why don't we start about sharing with the audience three words that capture and really kind of summarize the space for you? Three words. Uh, sure. Uh, infinite, alluring, and dangerous. And... Besides the, obviously, the science story and the technology story of going to space, what do you think is the human story of going to space? And would even push it as like the nature story of you know, going to space? It's fundamental human nature. Uh, all children leave home eventually. And it's been going on to, you know, for 300,000 years with our species. And uh, that's never going to stop. And the only thing that's ever really limited it is our inventiveness and our, you know, we didn't cross rivers until we invented rafts. And then we didn't cross mountains until we invented clothing and stored food. And we didn't cross oceans until we invented ships. And we didn't fly until we invented airplanes. And we didn't leave Earth until we invented rocket ships. But all of those things have been invented. And they've allowed us to start to go exploring other places. It's fundamental human nature. And it's given us the richness and the understanding that we have as, uh, as the, I don't know, the alpha species on this planet. And, and when you now build the capability to leave Earth, now uh, there is an infinity of opportunity to explore and to maybe try and, and understand. So it, it's natural continuation of what we've always done, but just enabled within my lifetime by uh, human invention. I mean, that's the whole purpose of life, right? To go and push the boundaries and to seek new places. And just like you said, and I've written about that, how if we're not going to certain places, it's not because we don't want to, it's just because we can't until we do get to that place that we can. But life, you know, it went from single cell to multi-cell and then it keeps pushing. And now the planet is about to go from single planet to multi-planetary. And I think that the kind of evolution leap that we're going to see now that it's become multi-planetary is just going to be a, of a total new scale, would you say? Well, you know, we left Earth permanently 21 years ago by uh, staying on the International Space Station as a species. Uh, people from 15 of the leading nations of the world have been exploring and experimenting and peacefully cohabitating on board a human outpost for an entire generation of life. That, that's unprecedented in our history. It's the space station's the biggest thing we've ever built off the planet. And it, it's running hundreds and hundreds of experiments every day. And so we're already kind of extra planetary. You know, we, we have a, a sub, small subset of us that don't live on, on Earth anymore. And the moon will be next. I'm not sure if the moon qualifies as interplanetary, but it's definitely uh, somewhere besides Earth. And it's only three days away, so it's a natural first place as our technology gets good enough to start to settle. And then eventually we'll be able to cross that enormous ocean between us and Mars. But that's still far harder than most people think. But it's the natural progression. I mean, you left home. I left home. Uh, you have to. We can't you know, all stay in the same hut that we were born in. And... Um, and that's what leads to invention and discovery and, and uh, pushing people to the, to the, to the limits and, and the, 
you know, the necessity of invention is our, our innate nature. It's what's created so much of the richness of life and the opportunity for art and science. So um, going interplanetary or at least extraplanetary will only enrich in that and challenge people in new ways. You know, one of the things, Daniel, that I'm really looking forward to is the art that comes from the new place. You know, if you look at bluegrass music or, or jazz, those are imported music from somewhere else, but then coalesced and mixed and bubbled together in a new environment that then creates an entire new style of art form. And that's going to happen also. So, yeah, so I, I think that that's the coolest part is uh, is what it does for for us historically, for humanity and all the opportunity that it opens. I think art is really, I recently wrote about how space needed to focus a lot on creative storytelling and artists. I think one of the successes of the Renaissance was people, certain people who had a lot of capital and power saw in artists their capacity to envision the future. And had they not been for the Medici, maybe the Leonardo da Vinci and all these great artists that we take for granted today had not existed. But art, I mean, you were, is it fair to say that you were the first musician in space? Oh, no, there have been musicians in space since uh, the very beginning. I mean, uh, Yuri Gagarin played guitar, you know, not lots of people play. Um, <laughs> and, and there were harmonica players and some of the early, because you had to bring a tiny instrument on some of the very early American ships. When I went and helped build the Russian space station Mir back uh, 26 years ago, um, gosh, 26 years ago, but, uh, there was a guitar up there and it had been launched for previous space stations when they had transferred the vital equipment from one of their old space stations to the new ones. They brought that, that St. Petersburg guitar across. So music always travels with us. Every sailing ship of adventure and discovery, think about, you know, hornpipes and, and all of the sea shanties and everything. That's because as we explore and leave home, uh, music comes with us. And uh, there's, there's a cave above the Rhine uh, where archaeologists were digging and they found musical instruments from what they figure 42,000 years ago, you know, just uh, hollowed out the leg bone or the, the naturally hollow leg bone of a bird that if you blow in one end, it whistles. And if you drill holes, you can play it like a recorder. So music's been around longer than any written history. And it's nice that there's a guitar permanently up on the International Space Station. And I'm I know from experience that it gets played almost every day by by at least one member of the crew. But now all of them gets a hundred was it one hundred and eleven million views of the video that and that's the, the really the power of art and music, you know, combining these places to Earth. I mean you have you covering David's song and you were playing it in space and it created a language that was unifying about these two places. And that was art, you know, becoming something bigger. Yeah, I, I can describe something to you in words, and it, it kind of depends on your and my comprehension and use of the English language and, and maybe the word choices that I make. Or I could paint you a picture of it. Or, or, or perhaps, you know, I could make a sculpture of something for you and you could look at that sculpture. But also I could write music about it and it may not even have words, but music is uh, immensely evocative. Music is ancient, you know, and, and it's try and go a whole day without any music at all in your life. And, you know, I've played in many bands my whole life. I remember standing out once we were playing a song that had a real strong beat. And I looked in a little one that had just learned to walk, you know, maybe uh, 14 months. And that little one couldn't stand. They had to walk out and they were, they were moving with the music. They don't know anything about anything, but music got right into their very soul. And, and so it's another way maybe to try and explain the humanity of the spaceflight experience is to uh, try and express it musically. And David Bowie was such a terrific artist. He, he never flew in space, but his song Space Oddity, I, I, my, my son changed some of the words to bring it up to date. And, and David Bowie was happy with that. But um, as you say, hundreds of millions of people have seen that video. And maybe then intuitively, yeah. intrinsically, they get a better feel for what space flight and being in space is actually like, which far supersedes my ability perhaps to just uh, 
describe it to them using mere words. I was writing um, about how music is really our connection. I did this keynote presentation called The Power of Nature, and I talk about how the rhythm, rhythms are really important in, in life. You know, you have the rhythm of the days and nights and then around the sun, and all these rhythms are creating disruptions. And music is really one, it's a rhythm that is disrupted by notes that creates the melody. So music is really kind of this fundamental connection to what life is and the richness of it is that rhythm that is supported and embraced with all these disruptions and that creates music. And that's why every time we hear it, we're just draw back into this like essence of life. I've had the experience of, of sitting with someone where we didn't share one word of a common language, you know, on a train and, but one of us has a guitar and just pass the guitar back and forth. You can make each other laugh, you know, and, yeah. and you can make each other cry just through the, the language of the music itself. And I know I, we had a band practice last night. In fact, a bunch of us, I knew a lot of the musicians, but I didn't know everybody because we're getting ready for a, a big stage show. And, um, and the the shared nature of creating music with people it, it it's not like anything else you know and and no one has ever quite done it this way before and looking around inside the creative process of music is one of the things i like most in the world um because there's a level of connection and everyone can feel where the music's going to go next you know what what is this chord change going to be how is this going to happen what is the percussion or the the rhythm section is going to do and uh it, it it's just a, a subset of life or a subset of human behavior, but it's a really precious one to me. And, and it's like no other. Before we get into your book, I just want to ask you one more question about music. Were you a musician before you became a science or an astronaut or were you, which one came first? Well, we're all born musicians. Just some of us have perhaps practiced more or learned more instruments or, or sing more. Uh, and everyone has varying skills, right? Uh, you're probably not the best musician in the world. That might be one person. And you're not the worst musician in the world. You're just in the middle with everybody else. We're, you know, everyone's a musician. I guess, though, we tend to not recognize someone as a musician until they can play an instrument or sing a song. And my brother and I bought our first guitar when I was about nine or 10. Uh, we went to an auction sale and my dad was off buying tractor parts and at the household goods, they were holding up this, this old six string acoustic and uh, no one was bidding. And I was like goading my brother and we had visions of being Elvis or something. And he, in a squeaky voice, he bid five bucks and we had a guitar for $5. And that guitar wasn't even worth $5. It was terrible action, really hard on the hand, but, but that's the guitar we learned on. And then uh, eventually we had enough skills and confidence to go buy a better guitar. In fact, it's behind me here now, a Yamaha FG 180. And uh, I st I've had that guitar my whole life. Now I have a lot more guitars. Um, so I guess my idea of becoming a musician was before I was 10. And then I actually started training with my brother, um, uh, just the Mel Bay music method and learning uh, music as a kid. And then I played trombone in high school and in college and in stage band and marching band and jazz band and things. And so I guess I've been some sort of trained musician most of my life also. And then I've been a stage musician playing in, you know, touring and festivals and pubs and weddings and everything else um, most of my adult life as well. So none of that was going to stop when I got to the space station. So how... How, when did that desire to to leave, not to leave the music, but to really transition into the astronaut career, the training, becoming a pilot? Because they're, they're pretty at the far end of the spectrum of direction. What, what happened for you to go there? Or was it always something on the sideline that you wanted to pursue? Yeah, hardly anyone gets to become an astronaut as a sideline. It normally has to be a main line. And uh, in my case, uh, I was originally taken by fantasy and science fiction and reading Jules Verne, well, really comic books first, and then uh, Arthur C. Clarke and Jules Verne and, and Isaac Asimov and Ray Bradbury. 
and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, you know, reading all those adventure kind of stories. And then Star Trek, the original run, Star Trek with Kirk and Spock and McCoy. And, uh, that came on when I was uh, a kid uh, growing up on the farm. So we got to move the antenna bunny ears on the TV and watch Star Trek once a week. Um, and then 2001, A Space Odyssey, that movie, the mashup between Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke, incredible film. And, and all of those ideas uh, inspired by an artistic vision of the future that didn't exist uh, kind of planted the seed. But unlike the generations of kids before me, I was also in parallel watching actual space flight happen with uh, Gagarin and then Al Shepard and then the Mercury Gemini and then the Apollo program. And the summer that I bought that guitar when I was nine years old was the same summer that uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And that crossover between fantasy and, um, and reality of human activity. And I thought, wow, if those guys can do it, then this isn't just fantasy. This is actually a career choice. This is a thing that you could do. So of all the things that I might do when I grow up, why don't I do that? And I had no idea how to do it, but that's what really uh, firmly uh, put the bit in my teeth of that's what I want to do with my life. Even though, you know, I'm Canadian, we didn't have NASA, uh, we didn't have rocket ships, but I thought, well, one very long ago that the Americans didn't have NASA and rocket ships either. Things, things are going to change. Mm -hmm. And then, Obviously, the huge onus of responsibility is going to be on me to change myself, to try and turn myself into someone like whatever, Mike Collins or Neil Armstrong, so that maybe someday someone will trust me to, to command a spaceship. So was the Canadian Space Agency quite, I mean, active and was able to give you the path necessary for you to do it? Or were you, were, did you have to go down to the States and go through the NASA um, uh, process? Uh, when I decided to start turning myself into an astronaut, it was impossible. There was no route mm -hmm. for a Canadian to be an astronaut. It wasn't hard. It just, it was impossible, but I thought things are definitely going to change. Uh, and there's time, you know, I'm only 10, so I'm not ready to go anyway. Um, and so I worked and trained for, uh, two decades and went to multiple universities. And I looked at the original astronauts and thought, what, what do they know how to do? You know, what do they got that I haven't got? What have they, what have they learned how to do? And number one, they were fit. So, okay, I'll keep myself fit. Fine. That's simple. Um, and, uh, they knew how to operate really complicated things. I mean, Buzz Aldrin had a PhD out of MIT. So like, okay, I'm going to have to go study technical things at university. Um, and some sort of engineering that that's what appealed to me most. And, um, and then you fly a spaceship. It's a verb, you know? So, okay, I need to learn how to fly. I don't have any money, but, uh, there's, there's normally programs available in Canada. There's air cadets, uh, where if you join up in the air cadets and you do well enough on the tests, then they'll teach you to fly for free. And before I had my driver's license, I had my pilot's license. You know, I was flying airplanes before I was legal to drive on the road. Um, and and then I looked and I realized, well, a lot of them are test pilots. And uh, in order to be a test pilot, uh, you have to already be an extremely accomplished pilot and then go to test pilot school for a year. But I thought that all sounded fascinating anyway. And so I joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. I went through the military academies, went did graduate school, and then also went through pilot training uh, in addition to my air cadet training and went through and became a fighter pilot and uh, was a combat pilot in the Cold War, intercepting Soviet bombers. And then I went to test pilot school. I was selected. One, one Canadian a year goes to test pilot school. I was selected and went and trained with the U.S. Air Force at Edwards. And, and right around then, Canada formed a space agency. You know, they didn't have one up until then, but they formed one in 1989 after a few years of government uh, decision making. And um, and then I worked as a test pilot, uh, in fact, on exchange with the U.S. Navy. So I was a U.S. Navy test pilot as a Canadian uh, because we both fly F-18s. And um, and in 92, all of those qualifications came together and the brand new three year old Canadian space agency said, we want a crop of astronauts. And so they had a national selection, uh, 50, 330 people applied and uh, they hired four of us. And then I immediately got sent down 
along with one of uh, one of the other Canadian astronauts to um, to start training with the NASA astronaut corps. Uh, and so I was in Houston for uh, 21 years as a member of the NASA astronaut corps, but as a Canadian from the Canadian Space Agency. You went up to space. You came down. You started to write. I mean, you wrote a memoir of, of your experience, which is a it's not fiction. It's your actual um, testimonial of your experience. But then you started to get into fiction writing. Was the process of writing so so positive that you decided to go beyond the, the just the the writing about your experience? Because now. Um, you know, you have the Apollo murders, and it's a it's a pretty <laughs> appropriate thriller. Uh, James Cameron says it's a nail biting thriller, and the the premise of the book is between the Russians and the Americans on the moon. But was the the, the writing for you so like an, another extension of that artist of the musician in you, uh, wanting to expand more than just you know telling your experience in space? I always like writing. I mean, uh, language and writing was my favorite subject in school. I just thought that they're not going to let me fly in space if, if all I know how to do is write, you know, because I'll crash the spaceship. So, uh, but I've always enjoyed writing. Um, and I think everyone should attempt to be good at using their own native language. You know, it just seems, seems logical. Um, and the first book, the one you mentioned, Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth, it's really not a memoir. It's, it's, it's exactly what the title says. It's an astronaut's guide to life on Earth. You know, it's very much ideas of yeah. how to live a better life. Because after 30 years, all the various things I'd done, I thought some of the lessons might be helpful to everybody. And, and it it's pretends to be a memoir, uh, you know, follows sort of a career. But, but actually, it's just a book of ideas. Um, but then I thought it would be, rather than trying to just tell the factual story, you have a lot more freedom to get into people's visceral reaction and how everybody actually behaves. What does it make you feel like? And what does it make other people feel like? And that's where fiction gives you so much more freedom. You know, it's like the difference between writing a march, you know, which is complex, you know, John Philip Sousa and those great songs or writing, uh, you know, a really interesting folk song or some sort of ballad or some sort of uh, power chord rock something. And so, so I thought I would challenge myself to write a, uh, a uh, thriller fiction book. And so I, I decided to write alternative history thriller fiction. I wrote The Apollo Murders. And uh, maybe you don't know, Daniel, but uh, just right now we're signing with a British production company to turn it into a uh, an eight-part TV series. And I'm not sure who's going to pick it up or, you know, Apple or somebody like that. But that's so that's pretty amazing to me that uh, something that I invented and, and sat actually in this room at this desk and, and created out of my own head now has a pretty good shot of getting on, you know, millions of screens all around the world. But what I really like about it is talking to people after they've read it and discussing why characters did things and, and how did this arc of story actually happen and what was real and what wasn't real. Um, and and it, it's one more way to kind of open up your own head uh, and, and let other people in on what's going on inside. And, and, and I learned a lot too. So I'm, I'm currently writing uh, the next book in the series. It'll be the fifth book that I've written, but uh, the follow on to uh, the Apollo murders, uh, I'm, I'm about halfway through writing it right now. Can you, um, can you share with us your, uh, a little bit of your creative process? Is that something that you, I've written the piece in the, in my book, Feel the Wild about uh, waiting. Um, Cause during my solo wilderness expeditions, you know, when you do photography, often you wait for hours. Um, and then the minute that you look away, this is the, the, the moment that the shot happens and then you have to wait again. And how some artists train themselves for that creative um, output to come out. You know, it's a more something that every day they wake up. And some others really, they just, you know, they only do it when it comes to them. Are you... Where are you in the spectrum of the creative process? Trained uh, uh, creativity or whenever it, it comes to you? Well, I do, I do a lot more than write, of course, just like you do. And, um, you know, I help run some space companies and I teach and I make television series and I run a big technology incubator. You know, there's a lot of stuff filling my plate. And what I've found is if, 
I want to actually be creative, then I have to get some mental room. I need to, to not have the pressing issues of the day uh, weighing on my, uh, on my psyche or my thought processes. So the way that I found best to do that is number one, have a quiet place like this one. I'm actually in a cabin on an island uh, this cabin was built in 1896 and, uh, although we have internet now and, uh, and I try and get my work all done in the afternoon and the evening. And then I wake up early exercise, uh, first thing, and then, uh, sit at this desk. And then if, if there's some things cropped overnight that cropped up overnight that have to be done, deal with them, get those things done and then clear everything away and then give myself the objective now. Uh, of trying to write a thousand words and spend the whole morning do it. Try and open up the whole morning uh, till a late lunch or whatever to do my best to try and write a thousand words. Because that, you know, that's what other authors, you know, I didn't make any of this up. I read Stephen King's book on writing and I watched part of James uh, Patterson's master class and I looked online and, and I read a lot of really, really good thriller fiction. And, and from all of that, I sort of pieced together how I want to do it. But then the real process, Daniel, is I sit here and I, I review what I wrote the last couple of days. So I remember where the story is and what people were up to. And then I think, what would they do next? You know, and sometimes your character surprises you or a new character pops up, you know, that you thought was going to be a bit part. And you realize, holy cow, this person's taken over the story, but that's OK. And and then uh, you you start writing and you realize, oh, I don't know that. You know, what is the capital of Ohio? Dang. And and so there's there's I do constant research the whole time I'm writing, looking up spelling, looking up punctuation, looking up facts, and then maybe looking up room, you know, for the story. But it's all within the framework of something I've already considered. I've thought about the big picture of how this story ought to go, and it, it has to be uh possible and, and, you know, a reasonable story arc. It's got to have room for excitement and surprise. Um, there have to be the characters in it that, you know, I, I have some rough idea of who they are and how it's going to interplay. And I know sort of how the story, how I want it to end up. And once I'm convinced, it's as if you gathered a whole bunch of threads and said, okay, now I'm going to make a carpet. If, if you don't have enough thread and enough colors, you're like, well, I, I, I'm not going to be able to make a carpet. I got to get more thread. And so initially I do a lot of research and thread gathering to try and make sure that I'm going to be able to weave it all together. But then the mechanics of it, get up, exercise, clear the plate, and then sit down and just start writing. I think it was Ray Bradbury who said, nobody can write 500 bad short stories. If you want to be a writer, you just got to write and you're going to learn and get better at it as you go. And, and I, 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 I agree with him. You just got to write. You just got to do and, and, trust yourself in the process of whether it's music, you know, being a musician or, I mean, whatever you, you do, I think that's one of the amazing um, thing about the human species is we don't always know what to do, but we figure a way to get better and better and we fail, but then we get back up. And every time we find ourselves, like I know that still the writing process there's always a time that I look at that blank page and I'm like, it's not coming. And then I start to get a little bit nervous, but because I've learned to stick with it, there's, I know that there's a moment there's going to be that little switch and then it starts. And then you know that like, okay, now I'm going to be resourceful. I know how to find these answers that I'm looking for so that you can move forward. And some days suddenly you've written 1,500 or 1,600 words. I, I have a, 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 a sort of a thing that just illustrates what you just said. Um, when you're living on a spaceship, your psychological support crew tries to get interesting people for you to talk to once every few weeks. And, uh, and one of the people they, talk, they got to talk to me was Neil Young, the uh, musician. And uh, so they said, hey, Neil Young's going to give you a call tomorrow, which is pretty exciting. Uh, you know, he's written some legendary stuff. And I, some of the first music I ever learned on guitar was, was to play, you know, Heart of Gold or something by Neil. Um, and, uh, and so I was talking to Neil, but two things that he told me, I think, are really relevant to what you just said. And one was in all of the music that he's written, he said, I don't write music. I just write music down. 
And what he meant was, I don't, there's no, nothing highfalutin about it. It's not fancy. It's like, today I'm going to write a song. Instead, it is, hey, that's a cool idea. Let me write that down. Huh. Hey, oh yeah. And what he, he recognizing that it's just a creative process when the mood strikes you or when you get the idea, write it down. Don't give yourself some great burden of being a music writer. Just don't write music. Just write music down. The other thing he said, which I think helps illustrate that, is uh, don't judge your artistic creation until you finished it. Because if you judge every word or every phrase or every rhyme or every sentence, then you're you're gonna you're gonna agonize over it so much that you'll talk yourself out of completing it. Um, and wait until you finish the song or, or the whatever uh, the chapter. And then go back and edit it. And who knows? And, and I mean, Neil Young wrote some real clunkers. He wrote some songs that are terrible, you know, but he wrote some songs that are brilliant. And But I think what's really key out of that is the creative process. You just have to get it flowing. You need to write it down and you need to defer judgment until you've got this creativity complete. And then you can go back and, you know, sculpt it a little bit more. And he was talking specifically with me about music at the time, but I have really taken that advice to heart in, um, in writing books also. I, I think, and if I was a sculptor or a painter, I think uh, I, would, I would listen to those words just as carefully. I was recently having a conversation about the difference between artists and content creators, because um, often we confuse the two. And I think the content creators will all fo- also... Um, um, most of the time, they create with the intent of the public already in mind. They're they're lead, they're having the public lead their creation. What am I doing that can please them or I can generate the, the likes? The artist, they create to find answers or actually to lead the public to certain places. It's them not doing it with the hope of getting accolades or getting lights, but really to be more on the fringes or to create, give it an experience for the public and elevate them rather than just, you know, the other one where it's the the public before. What do you think? Well, when I write music on guitar and I, I wrote and recorded a whole album, in fact, while I was on the space station called uh, Space Sessions, Songs from a Tin Can. Um, uh, the guitar often... Uh, comes up with the music for me. I, I'm just, you know, noodling or playing or, or fiddling around. My hands are playing something they knew. And then there's some little hammer on or lick or chord change. And I go, wow, that's that's different. That wasn't, that's not something I'm used to hearing. And and then I'll just pursue that and, and develop that. And then I'll be grabbing a piece of paper and writing down that chord sequence. And then, and you know, oh, what, what words would go with that? And, and that, it, it's just, pure uh, sort of uh, associative inspiration um, where, where the guitar becomes an extension of yourself to allow you to, you know, imagine if you could move your fingers and harp music played or something, you know, it, it, it allows you to, to extend beyond yourself to then uh, maybe create something that, that otherwise you'd, you'd be incapable of. And, and so I, I, I love the, the uh, the spontaneity of that. And some days, just like Neil said, hey, you can't write a song today. It's just not going to happen. There's nothing going on or your your spark is all used up. But some days, you, um, you know, it's just there uh, and your hands were ready to show you something different. And and when that happens, it's really nice. And But as you say, when you get to the end, you may go, oh, that's lovely and pretty. And then you play it for someone else and they go, meh. <laughs> go, oh well, that's okay. Uh, I created something and I like it, and maybe maybe it'll work into something later, or but then you might play it for someone else and they go, wow, that's really cool. And why don't you go to the D minor seventh instead? And and and, and it can really evolve into something. And, uh, and and to me, that that's that's the real real fun part. When not only have you done something that that you're proud of and that you like, but that that then other people can share and or maybe even contribute to. Absolutely. There's a magic in that moment when you realize that there's something more that came out of thin air and just connects people. Um, Chris, what is the, back to, to your book, your latest book, which is a series and well, I can't wait to see it on, on the screen. Um, so what is the premise? Because a lot of it is actually kind of almost timely with 
what's happening with some of the, the, the relationship, but it involves the Americans and the Russians and being on the moon is a thriller. Can you explain a little bit more what's the storyline of the uh, book? Yeah, it's alternative history fiction. So it is set in 1973, actually in the spring of 73. And if you think about what was going on then, it was the end of the Apollo program. So Apollo 17 had gone. Um, it was uh, the Nixon administration coming apart, you know, with Watergate. And it was in the fall of 73 that he said, I am not a crook, you know. And and so his um, his legacy, all of that was in the news. It was the end of the Vietnam War. Um, it was the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. That was going on. And, uh, and so there was all of that conflict. And there were some things happening in space that nobody knows about. At the time, the Soviets had a spy space station with people on board that, would, that had a huge telescope inside to be able to do spy work down on the surface. And it was armed. It had a machine gun mounted to the outside. And they called that space station Almaz, which means diamond. Um, and that was real. And they had a, um, a rover driving around on the moon called Lunachod. And, uh, and so that was an interesting framework for my story. And then there was an Apollo 18 and Apollo 19, but because of budgetary restrictions and, and fear of another Apollo 13, Nixon canceled those two missions, but the rockets were built. Um, and so for my story, I had, um, I had Apollo 18 actually fly and he got the money for Apollo 18 from the, uh, from the U S air force, which is how they finance the shuttle. So it's not a far fetched story. And then that makes the purpose of the mission a little more military than it would have been otherwise. And so the story follows the thread of the crews and Apollo 18 and uh, includes the Almaz Soviet space station and then all the way to the surface of the moon. And, um, And, and then the story comes right around to the big climax, uh, of course, splashing down just, just north of Hawaii. So it's a big rollicking tale with cosmonauts and astronauts and space stations and machine guns and all. Um, but I, I'm really delighted. It's already in 14 languages, I think, or going into 14 languages. And, and I just love the reaction worldwide. And, and pretty lucky as a first-time author, because I think someone told me there are a million books published every year. So, so to get... Uh, you know, lots of people reading a book is a difficult thing to do. So I'm, I'm really pleased that that um, that a lot of people are enjoying reading the Apollo murders. This is Henry. Henry is a uh, he's, a, he's a puppy. He's nine months old. So he just decided he was feeling a little bit lonely. So I uh, he wanted up in my lap. But anyway, this is Henry. He's a good boy, and uh, we'll have to go for a walk after you and I talk. Absolutely. Did you um, did you always have dogs in your uh, in your life? Yeah, I grew up on a farm and uh, we always had dogs. And then my wife and I, we've had dogs since before we got married. We uh, we got our first dog before we got married. So uh, yeah, we've always had dogs. And I think dogs are, you know, they're a natural companion for, for people. And they're very, uh, they're very attuned to human emotions and good companions and fun. So yeah, I, uh, I, we've had multiple types and sizes and dogs over the years. But Henry is the current dog, and he's a good. He's Henry is a very good dog. <laughs> I am um, when I married my wife uh, six years ago. She came with her own dog. It was a little Maltese Bichon. And um, if you had told me in my bachelor days that I would be the type of guy who would give presentation with a white dog in a backpack, I would have said, "No, no, no, this is not me." And I ended up being the solo wilderness explorer on stage giving presentation with a little white dog in the backpack. Unfortunately, Kobe passed away um, 18 months ago, um, but I definitely uh, can con concur with you how they, they really open your heart. I mean, they are just these creatures that if you take care of them, they have, you, you have unconditional love. Um, and I think it's one of the best ways to, uh, to open your heart. Yeah, I, I can just see however many tens of thousands of years ago of of some little group of humans and they were getting peril or attacked by wolves and, and maybe killed the parents and then had the puppies. And all it took was one sort of earnest um, needing look from a puppy. And you can just imagine like, well, maybe, you know, we could 
take care of it for a minute or a day or a week. And a dog raised, you know, on, in a human environment gets a different set of priorities. So I, I don't think it took very long at all to start domesticating dogs. And, uh, and now of course, with a variety of breeds, uh, it, it's incredible, but yeah, I, I'm very glad that, uh, that there have always been dogs in my life. Does he travel with you or? Uh, he did today. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he he uh, he's small enough to fit under the seat, so he does. He travels uh, where where we go. Yes, and it, it's uh, it's you know I like uh, I took my granddaughter to um, a, a big natural history museum on the weekend, um, and it's a really healthy thing to do because you see the world through a fresh set of eyes, uh, and uh, and a dog notices things that you sure don't know, and they have different values and, and different priorities than you do. And so sometimes uh, it's good to try and pay attention to what is the dog actually looking at? What are they noticing? What are they hearing or smelling that I'm either ignoring or incapable of hearing or smelling? Uh, because they're having maybe not a richer experience, but they're having a different experience than you are. And the same thing when you when you take a child to a museum, they see it differently and different things are important. And, uh, and I think uh, it, it's almost like, like having a, another uh, sense yep. uh, of, of being able to absorb what's happening around you, to have uh, a pet or a child or something there to help you experience what's happening. I remember reading about this, uh, a book about dogs. Um, it was this author who has done a tremendous amount of research. And she said something that really changed my understanding of that perspective is that while we are a, um, a species that is uh, based on sight. We see things, we see the change, we see the people. Um, dogs ex um, experience that the time through smell, time has a different smell. Something that is young doesn't smell the same thing as something that is middle age and something that is older. So it's less visual, but it's really through the smell that we get to experience time and all these other things of us. It's, you know, it's based on science. So it's a, it's a really a different experience of the world. Yeah, they, they definitely experience the world differently. I agree. And but that's a cool thought. I hadn't really thought of the fact that they can smell the age of things and therefore understand it in a different way than we do. But yeah, it makes complete sense. Chris, before we uh, we get to the conclusion, I just want to briefly get your opinion on space at the beginning was a more of a dividing field, different countries that were competing for it. Then it became a unifying narrative, the, the space station as this place of collaboration. When I was talking to, uh, to Scott Perzinski, he told me that one of his three words was collaborative, just the idea that these people from different nations went over there with, with the intent of working together. But now as the space is reopening and being more accessible to people, do you think that there's, there's, we're going to need a lot of work and, and diplomacy to keep that collaborative and not finding as the space becomes more dividing rather than unifying? Well, everything goes in cycles and, uh, you know, uh, political cycles, weather cycles, your own natural yearly or daily cycle or the cycle of your entire life. So there's no reason to think that uh, space exploration and development is going to be any different than all the other human endeavors. Um, but uh, I think it's been a terrific example of, 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 of shared uh, challenge and therefore cooperation. You know, the enemy of my enemy by definition is my friend, right? In this case, we have a common enemy and that is the complexity and the danger of space itself. And therefore, in order to uh, overcome it, it takes cooperation. No single person's getting to space, no, no, no small group of people. It's gonna take, it's gonna take a big team. And uh, in a lot of cases, the team is a lot stronger if they're not just in one small location or, or one particular political group, but if they're international. And that's really proven itself. During the MIR program and during the International Space Station program, we saved each other's bacon multiple times after the Columbia accident, after the uh, Soyuz accident, um, all, you know, 
there were always periods where each individual of the 15 partners was having a serious problem and the uh, the other ones could could carry the burden for a while so and that's not going to stop but there's always going to be times where there's there's conflict or one of the nations is going through something that that is uh you know is is undesirable um but it's going to go in fits and starts uh but even if you if it's only you know one step back and then a couple forward you're still starting to move forwards and we also maybe perhaps lose a little bit of understanding of just how quickly this has happened when i was born no one had flown in space all of human space travel has happened in less than my lifetime you know it's happening incredibly fast we've gone from impossible to uh, international team from 15 countries living and working peacefully together for two decades in space just so quickly and and we're on the cusp right now of of settling the moon and figuring out how to go even further and, and our robots are all over the place so so to me it's uh it's going amazingly fast and uh and we're doing it even though there are international objectives and occasional international conflicts so yeah it's never been easy um, it sort of flies in the face of, of history, maybe even flies in the face of common sense, but it flies. And, and to me, that's the, the really uh, cool and fascinating part of it and, and what's still continuing today and the part that I've worked hard to continue, but also the part that continues to inspire me. Absolutely. Now you're going to go and walk the dog. Where can people find, I mean, your book is on Amazon, Indigo, in all the places everywhere. It's everywhere. So it's anywhere you can buy a book. Yeah, if you just just Google it, it's there. Hey, shh, shh. quiet, Henry. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's everywhere. And actually, the the audio version of it is is the, the guy who did it. His name is Ray Porter. He's a superb actor, and uh, and he did a, a terrific job of reading the Apollo murders um, for so people can just listen to it if they don't have time to sit and read it. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's everywhere, and it, and it's coming in more and more languages. Uh, you know, pr- a new language every month or something. So so no matter what what language you'd like to read it in, hopefully we'll get it there fairly soon. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, um, and I look forward that our path will cut across now that people are traveling again uh, in some of the space events or even on a creative circuit. I'm pretty sure that uh, you and I will uh, will. Uh, meet face to face. Thank you very much. I look forward to it. I really enjoyed the conversation, Daniel, even just a virtual face to face, but it's a small planet. I've been around (laughs) it 2,600 times. I'm sure we'll bump them into each other somewhere. Absolutely. All right. Be well.